This episode of the Happy Diabetic Kitchen Podcast is sponsored by my diabetes supplier, U.S. Med. U.S. Med offers free shipping and a 90-day supply with every order. To see how they can simplify your diabetes care, call 1-877-840-8218. I did, and I can feel the love. Remember, there is a much better solution, U.S. Med. Hello, everyone. I am Chef Robert Lewis, the Happy Diabetic, and this is the Internet's most delicious cooking podcast. I'm here in the kitchen getting ready to explore a healthy and happy diabetic lifestyle. I want to take the mystery out of healthy cooking, explore some amazing foods, and my personal diabetic journey with all my successes and all my challenges. Let me help you live your best happy diabetic lifestyle. So, Welcome to the kitchen, and if you're new to the show, I can't tell you how excited I am that you're here. So, stay tuned, everybody. We will be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to the Happy Diabetic Kitchen. So happy that you're here. I love talking with people who are making a difference in the diabetic space. And today, we've got a very special guest, Tiara Smith. She's the director of Beyond Type 2. She also is all about Tiara Talks Food. She's, in my opinion, a food expert, a great human being. Tiara and I have done a lot of projects together, and she is the sweetest person ever. And just to give you a little background about Tiara, she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in July of 2017 at the age of 25. And since her diagnosis, she's focused on her academic studies and career on diabetes awareness and living a full life with it. And we know that can be a challenge. She's very passionate about helping others share their story and feeling empowered to build a life to become their healthiest selves. Now, back in December of 2018, Tiara joined Beyond Type 1 team to continue her work in diabetes as a project manager and for Beyond Type 2. Since becoming its director in April 2019, Tiara was re-diagnosed with LADA diabetes. Now, outside the office, when she's not at work, Tiara enjoys going to movies, hiking with her dog, listening to music, cooking awesome and healthy meals, She holds an MS in Nutrition Education from the American University. I'm so excited to have her on the show. So sit back, tighten those seatbelts, because coming up next on the podcast is the recipe of the podcast, my caramelized salmon of love. Stay tuned. We will be right back. So before we get into the recipe of the podcast, my salmon caramelized with a fruit salsa, let's talk a little bit about some health benefits of salmon. Salmon is that tender, reddish, firm fish. It's one of the most popular fish choices in America, thanks in part to its rich, buttery flavor. And that's a good thing for your health. You can choose from a handful of different Pacific salmons, including sockeye, pink, Coho, King, or what they call Chinook, and many of these come from the wild. Now, Atlantic salmon is also a very good option. Most of the salmon you'll find at your local supermarket are all farm-raised. Now, a serving size of salmon, anywhere from 3 to 4 ounces, is about 200 calories. It's very low in saturated fat, and it's a good source of protein. It's also one of the best sources of vitamin B12, busting with potassium and other nutrients like iron and vitamin D. The vitamin B12 in salmon keeps blood and nerve cells humming and helps you make DNA. But for your health, the true benefit, in my opinion, of salmon is its wealth of omega-3 fatty acids. 
nature's rust prohibitor. Most omega-3s are essential fatty acids. So we know that salmon is a type of fatty fish that packs several nutrients that are really, really good for you. The American Heart Association, the AHA, advises eating fish such as salmon twice weekly because of the protein and heart-healthy omega-3 fatty acids. Consuming fish, like salmon, has other benefits from nutrients, including copper, potassium, selenium, vitamin B12, and vitamin D, which aids the body's functions. Some of the reasons I love salmon is the nutrition of this particular food. One three-ounce serving of wild Atlantic salmon contains basically the following nutrients. 121 calories, 5.4 grams of fat, 0.8 grams of saturated fat, 3.9 grams of unsaturated fat, only 37 grams milligrams of sodium, carbohydrates, zero, fiber, zero, added sugars, zero, and 16 whopping grams of protein. This is a delicious and nutritious food of love. So with that, let's get into the recipe of the podcast, my caramelized salmon of love. All right, everybody, let's get into it. So the total prep time is about 25 minutes, and it'll be about a one-hour cook time. This will make two servings. The nutritionals on this dish are 229 calories, total fat 11.45, sodium 50 milligrams, total carbohydrates 8.84, dietary fiber 1.17, and protein 17.83. Love the protein. All right, so what's in this amazing dish? Well, you're going to need one quarter cup of fresh mango diced, or you can use canned, a quarter cup of fresh pineapple diced, or you can use canned, two fresh strawberries diced, one kiwi peeled and diced, one teaspoon of fresh lime juice, one tablespoon of fresh cilantro chopped, two six-ounce fillets of salmon. You can even use steelhead trout if that's available. Two teaspoons of Splenda, some ground pepper, and a little balsamic glaze, which would be optional. So let's put it all together. So we're going to peel and dice the mango, strawberries, kiwi, and pineapple. Place them into a bowl, add the lime juice and cilantro, and we're going to set that aside. Next, we're going to season the salmon with cracked pepper and a dusting of Splenda. Place the fish in a hot, nonstick, oven-ready pan, which has been lightly coated with canola oil. The oil will shimmer when the pan is at the correct heat. Cook the salmon on medium heat, Splenda side down, for about four to five minutes until it's a nice golden color. Flip the salmon over and place it in a preheated 375 degree oven. Roast the salmon for about 10 to 12 minutes. Now, everyone's oven is a little bit different, but what you're looking for is the fish to be firm to the touch and the internal temperature should be about 150 to 160 degrees. Remove it from the oven and let the fish rest for about two to three minutes. Place the fish on a plate, top with the fruit salsa, and if you like, drizzle with some balsamic vinegar glaze. This is an amazing recipe of love. I know you're going to love this so much. Again, it's simple and it's easy. Now, if I can't find salmon for any particular reason, like I said earlier, I love to use steelhead trout. That works really, really great. You can make this with skin on salmon or skin off. But just remember, the Splenda goes on the side without skin, and that goes down in the pan first. Okay, everybody, when we come back, it's our interview with Tiara Smith. Tiara Talks Food. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Happy Diabetic Kitchen podcast. And wow, we have an amazing interview today. One of my very good friends, Tiara Smith, is with us in the house. Tiara, how are you? Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me on. I'm doing really great. How are you? I have never had it so good. So, Tiara, I have to ask you a quick question. Are you ready to get happy? 
I am so ready to get happy. It's Saturday. So, I mean, there's no choice but to be happy. And I had a really good workout. So I'm going to be happy all day. I can't wait to hear more about that. Well, Tiara, for all the happy diabetics out there, you and I have known each other for many years. We've done some amazing projects together. But why don't you share with with my listeners out there a little bit about you? Uh, So hi, everyone. Again, my name is Tiara, just like the crown. I've been living with diabetes since 2017. So I was diagnosed a few days after the 4th of July. I was misdiagnosed with type 2 diabetes originally. Um, my A1C was like 15 and a half percent. And it was my mom who originally noticed my symptoms, but I was in denial mode until I absolutely had to go to the doctor. And then a couple of years later, I uh, found out that I had type one, a um, lot of diabetes and have been managing that in, uh, in that respect ever since. Um, my journey with diabetes has been sort of like an up and down journey. Like I'm sure most people with diabetes can, can relate to just trying to figure out the right medication regimen you know, figuring out how exercise impacts your blood sugar, how everything impacts your blood sugar. But, um, but my, my foundational background for all of this is, um, nutrition. So I am a professional nutrition educator. So that's my, my degree background. And I love talking about body image, body positivity, and how to reform your relationship with food through cooking, through healthy cooking, ensuring that healthy cooking doesn't have to be boring. It can be fun and easy and quick. Um, but also I've been working in the diabetes industry for almost the last five years, um, as, uh, sort of like the beyond type two lady, uh, with beyond type one. Um, I started out as the project manager and then later become the, later became the director of beyond type two, where we provide resources for people with type two diabetes or in their loved ones. So practical information about CGMs or nutrition or mental health or exercise, to give people with type two the information that we know they don't always get at the provider's office and also providing them with that kind of community to, to be able to relate to others and bringing their stories to the forefront. So that way other people know that they're not alone. Um, and that's actually how I met you, Robert. So um, I've been working with Robert through beyond type two for years now. And Robert has always just been one of like the best advocates I've had the pleasure of meeting because he is happy. He is the happy diabetic and um, always just such an inspiration to other people. But that's been my journey so far. And uh, my goal is to become a certified diabetes care and education specialist. In my uh, spare time, I just you know, I love to work out, power lift, uh, stay active, hike. So that's, that's pretty much my life now. Awesome. Well, again, welcome to the podcast. Um, so happy that you're here. And if you're listening and you've never traveled to the Beyond Type to website, I would highly recommend it. It's a great resource for accurate, real world suggestions and recommendations on living your best happy diabetic life. So before we get into the food, Tiara, before we get into the food, let's talk about some exercise because, you know, exercise is a big part of living a diabetic lifestyle. And now you did use the words power lifter. (laughs) <laughs> right. So I'm already intimidated, but exercise does not have to be intimidating. Why don't you maybe share what you think the average type two, type one diabetic can do to just start down a, a journey, a path of better physical exercise? Because we know that is an important part of a diabetic lifestyle, right? Absolutely. And that's such a great question. I, I love it so much because like I said, I think people f- can find it intimidating, especially if you see a bunch of other folks who are going hard at the gym. They're like doing pull-ups and all these push-ups. And you're like, I can't do that right now. And that's okay. I would just say to start, just start moving. And so for me, that was um, just setting a goal that I was going to walk um, a mile um, twice a day. So two miles a day, once in the morning, once in the evening with my dog. That was it. That's all I needed to do. If I couldn't get two miles, I would be happy with just one mile. If I can do, if I couldn't do one mile, I'm happy with half, with half a mile. The goal is to do, to start with something that's easy and that's not going to feel overwhelming. So for a lot of people, that is just starting to walk and using that to build momentum. Because after walking, maybe you may like may say, I think I want to kick up the intensity a little bit. Maybe I'll try jogging or running or training for a five k. Um, maybe there's a part of you that may that may be like, you know. I've always wanted to try doing squats, body squats. You may want to start doing squats at the beginning of your walk. 
it's all about starting at a place that you know that's going to be really easy for you. Um, I don't think that anyone with diabetes has to just get a gym membership and just, you know, or pay for a personal trainer. I think it's just about making sure that you're moving your body every day um, and setting um, a goal, whether it's a time goal or a distance goal. Um, if you have a friend with you who can walk with you, walk and talk, try that, put on a podcast, listen to some music. But another thing I think is really important is to understand that this, that's exercise is your time. That's your time to, to, to kind of reset in your day or to, or to let go of stress. I think of my time at the gym as a way to sort of challenge myself. So it's me versus me. I'm not worried about what other folks are doing in the gym, even if I am taking a group class. Um, I, I think of, you know, what, it, what would it be like if I could reach that next level of physical activity for me? How would I feel? And, and notice I haven't brought up blood sugar yet. I'm only talking about some other benefits, some things that really keep that momentum going because it has to be about your own journey. And I think if you're already going into it, trying to compare yourself to someone else who's been on their journey for you know a, a longer time or, or whatever, you're already kind of setting yourself for failure. Start with where you are and don't worry about anybody else. It's only about you. Um, and in a way to kind of relate this back back to your back to diabetes is that you know that diabetes is already, already your own journey. You you don't compare your A1C to someone else's because someone else has a bunch of other factors that impact their A1C. Um, but the way that you think about your physical activity journey should be similar to how you think about your diabetes journey, which is that it's all about you. It's it's your it's your personal goals. It's what you can do at that time. It's about your circumstances. Um, you don't need a fancy gym. You don't need a you know you don't just money on the personal trainer. You can just go outside and, and just and just walk mm -hmm. to start. Um, and if someone needs something that's like more programmatic, um, I think YouTube is a really good resource. I use a lot of that as well. Sometimes just to do cardio dance parties. If anyone if people who really know me know I love K-pop, so sometimes I do BTS dance parties in my living room just to get that cardio going. I it's, love it. It's it's about having fun. Yeah. It's having fun and challenging yourself. And, and there's nothing more rewarding than knowing they're taking that time to be, to, to kind of, sh to get strong and knowing that, that you are kind of beating your own personal records, what, whatever mm -hmm. that could be for you. And that should, the people should take great reward in that, no matter where you are. Here's what I'm walking away with that really is striking me from this conversation is when you say it's your personal journey, my personal journey. You know, because a lot of times I think there's pressure to compare ourselves to what, whatever the norm is or whatever people are comparing, but really it's your own journey, right? I think that's important. It takes the pressure off. Yes. And, and also like, you know, it, I think it's okay to find inspiration from other people. So there are people that you follow on Instagram, especially mm -hmm. other um, folks with diabetes who are in, who are in the fitness industry. It is, it's okay to take inspiration but it's also making sure that you take that inspiration to, to work it to your lifestyle. Right. Same thing we were, you know, to talk about, you know, how to start eating, eating health healthy. You know, we wouldn't necessarily say do everything that people who network are doing. We would say, take the bits and parts that you like and that you know that, that you can do easily. And you can use that same method when it comes to physical activity and exercise. Right. One size does not fit all in exactly. diabetes is what I've learned. Exactly. Well, okay, so we've got some exercise components, part of a healthy and happy, diabetic-friendly lifestyle. Um, what else do you think is important in, in maintaining a good balance with diabetes? Some other key things to maintaining a, a balanced lifestyle with diabetes is first accepting that not every day is going to be perfect. You're going to have days where diabetes is going to be harder to manage than others. And I think once you can accept that, you can accept that you don't need to be perfect in everything. If, if you're someone that is trying to stay within a range, so if you're someone that wears a CGM and you're like, I'm not at 70% see, uh, time and range today, but you're there maybe most of the time, it's, it's fine. Like diabetes, it's, you're going to have diabetes forever, unfortunately. So there's one day or a couple of days aren't going to, you know, dictate the rest of your life. Um, so that's one thing, just letting go of perfectionism, which is really difficult, I think, for a lot of us, especially since 
we're so careful about like the things that we eat in, in carbon right. count. I think the other thing is maintaining um it's fine or it's finding support, finding people that you can that you can confide in about the times when diabetes does get difficult. And that can be your healthcare provider, it could be a friend, um, it could be a family member, it could be folks at your gym or your local rec club, just someone that you can confide in to, to kind of help you along. And then another thing I, I think is just finding a healthy relationship with food is another is I think a big one because this is such a, a nutrition related chronic illness. I think it can it can be easy to obsess over the carb count of certain foods. And I would say let go of the perfectionism for that as well and learning to enjoy the food that's in front of you. Even if even if the carbs may not always be where you want them to be, the food is still something that's enjoyable and you enjoy, and you deserve to have that kind of joy in your life. So I would say those are like the key things for, for me to maintain that kind of balance and managing diabetes daily. Food should bring you joy. Food should always bring you joy. I agree 100%. And we will be right back. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about food. And I'm, I'm curious to know about your food history. Any memories from your youth uh, that you remember from maybe a grandma or a mom or a dad who cooked something for you? Anything come to mind? My mom. <laughs> and if she, I can't wait to, to have her listen to this. So there used to be like this tree outside of our apartment that we still live in, and they used to have berries. Now they were not the berries that you were supposed to eat. They're like <laughs> the berries that are actually kind of poisonous. I I caught myself like bringing them in, and I tried to make a berry pie with it. Oh but wow! I put them in a plastic bowl, and I put it in a microwave, and it exploded and destroyed the bowl. And oh, wow. I was like, what are you doing? You're not even supposed to be like, this is not even how you make a pie. And I was like, but I thought this is, you know, you melt the, you, you're trying to get it all hot and then you put the crust on. And she was like, no. And then she was like, I think she was like, you got them from the tree that you're not even supposed to be eating stuff out from. <laughs> so like definitely could have, it could have been a lot worse. Um, but I feel like that was, that's a memory that I hold dear to, to myself because I think it just shows that I'm, I've had a knack for trying to be creative. And I put that in quotes in, in the kitchen. But there are some other food memories that I have too. Just like growing up, um, my grandfather, um, who was from South Carolina, feeding us um, southern based foods. So lots of greens. Um, he made like some of the best like fried fish. Oh my god! Wow, nice. Um, my dad is Jamaican, so we would eat a lot of Jamaican food. So that means like jerk chicken, curry chicken. Um, curry goat, plantains, rice and peas, just beef patties. So, so I had such a rich um, cultural upbringing when, when it comes to food. And it, it just, it, it, it's something that I still hold dear to my heart today and I still eat that way. So diabetes has definitely not stopped me there. And then like, there are just some other food memories that I have of learning, of learning to cook and, let, and my mom letting me make things like spaghetti, spaghetti meatballs. Mm -hmm. It was just like taking like the jar of like prego sauce and then she taught me how to make how to make pasta and how to season my own um my own pasta sauce and then graduating to steak and things like that and really letting me enjoy that process so mm -hmm. and I think all of that has just built the foundation of like what's ended up becoming a legit career in and and for me later in life um yeah so I'm, I'm appreciative of that. It's it's funny, like reflecting on that and just seeing how it all adds up, which is like, yeah, I only see that in hindsight. You don't really yeah. know it in the moment. Right. Way to go, mom. That's all, that's <laughs> an awesome story. And I know you love to cook and and you've written a number and been part of a number of articles with Susan Weiner, Don Knoll, both who have been on this podcast. Good, good friends of the Happy Diabetic Kitchens. So what do you like to cook? Like if you could cook anything. What would it, what would you go for? So I I love to cook salmon. That's probably my my favorite. Salmon, thing. nice favorite thing. It's so easy to make. I always buy like the one pound boneless skinless salmon with um or from Trader Joe's, and I always tell myself I'm never going to eat the whole thing in one sitting, and I don't always follow that rule for myself. Yeah, um, but I love to um I use um no salt um Cajun seasoning. And I add my own salt to it. And I love to like add some cayenne pepper and then add a little bit of honey at the end. So it really glazes on mm. top. 
Um, and I like to also end it with some fresh cracked pepper. And also there's also some garlic mixed in there as well. And I love to put that over some like brown rice. So I like to add like a little bit of, bit of butter to some um, garlic and some other herbs to it. Maybe if I have it on hand, some parsley or some oregano or, or basil or mm. if I have Mediterranean spice mix um, or mix, then I'll use that as well. And then like, I also like to make um, steamed vegetables too. So this is more like a weeknight thing for me because it's really easy. And um, my favorite vegetables are like green, like green beans, French beans, broccoli is my favorites, maybe some carrots, some corn. And what I'll do is because I I'll always buy these things frozen and I'll heat them up in the microwave, steam them, and then I'll put them in a skillet with some um, olive oil spray. And I'll probably like also heat up like a garlic clove in there or so. And then I'll toss the steamed vegetables in there just so I can get some color on them. Wow. And kind of toss them a bit, add in some extra like Cajun seasonings or whatever else I want to play with in the kitchen. Curry powder is usually another go-to for me. Um, and then I'll wait till it gets all nice and brown and sauteed and I'll put it all on the plate. So easy ways to use like simple ingredients, but like without, without using like, a lot of dishes and also right. without spending a lot of money. It's delicious. Right. Um, do you own an air fryer? I do. Oh my God. I'm so glad you asked me that question. I just bought one like a month ago. It's literally right here. I use it. My, this well, when you're talking about that salmon dish, I make something similar, but I'll, I'll buy the salmon fillets, cut them up in one inch squares and marinate them. And then like nine minutes in the air fryer, they get all crispy and glazy. It's really delicious. I saw you post something. Was that what you posted? The I did. I posted some salmon and it was just a real basic Asian flavor. You know, some soy oh, sauce wow. and some water and some ginger, some garlic, a little bit of honey, some seasoning, let it marinate for two or three hours. Mm -hmm. Pop it in the air fryer, nine minutes, 160, 150 degrees. It's ready to go. I, I saw that and I was like, that looks so good. I think that was part of like, my inspiration making salmon the other night. Yeah. Um, also, like around this time of year, um, I use, uh, I have like a, a cast iron um, uh, griddle, which has like the flat top and then the grill top. Yes. Um, it's really great if you live in an apartment, you don't have access to like an actual grill. So I like to take like a flank steak um, or another type of lean steak and um, like to let it marinate and like maybe some like red wine and vinegar and garlic and a little bit of oil for a little bit. And then I put it on the grill top. And I also make like a chimichurri to go with it and have Ooh, an yeah. it. Um, and also like, you know, the ingredients that we're talking about, Robert, are things that people probably already have already. So um, I like to make a, like a quick um, dressing with some, some red wine vinegar, um, olive oil, oregano, and a little bit of honey, whisk it up, toss in some greens, and then have that on the side with like a steak with chimichurri sauce. Mm -hmm. And that's something that comes together really quickly. So a really good lunch or a really good dinner. Mm -hmm. that, those are things that I really love to make. Um, but I'll be putting this air fryer to use, Robert. Like I'm telling you, you're going to love it. I love it so much. You know, my kids got me an air fryer for my birthday. And I, you know, I, I was a little skeptical. I mean, I unpacked it and there sat another big appliance on my countertop. And then I just started messing around and like oven roasted cauliflower um, you know, mm -hmm. air fryer roasted broccoli, amazing. Amazing. So, and fast and simple. And fast. And 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 you also said this, like, it gives you the quality of an oven. So you're not like, turn on that hot oven, especially right. now warm out. Right. You're not going to want to, you're not want to burn the electricity or right. pay, for, pay for that gas. Right. Have it get hot in your kitchen. And it's so quick. Yeah. You put multiple things in it too. Have you put like a whole chicken in yours? Does your I have, what? I have not. I think mine can hold like a two, maybe two to four pound, like wow. young, a young chicken. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous to to use it for that function, but like smaller things, like salmon or shrimp or chicken, and also yeah. like with the um, with the with shrimp, you know, it's it's easy to overcook shrimp. Mm -hmm. And but with the air fryer, I've learned that if you like my our default is like 400 degrees for the one I use, mm -hmm. and that for maybe like six to seven minutes, I got the most juicy sucking yeah. shrimp. It wasn't even overcooked. Yeah. yeah. My advice to anyone wanting to get an air fryer is get this notion out of your head 
that it's for chicken nuggets and egg rolls and pe- <laughs> and and pizza rolls, right? <laughs> Think of it as a, as a small version of your oven that cooks pretty quick. Yeah. And it's simple to operate. It's really, really great. Oh, yeah. I yeah. love it. Stay tuned. We will be right back. So you might find this hard to believe, but I recently signed up for Medicare, right? Well, receiving your medical supplies like glucose monitors and insulin pumps can sometimes be a hassle, even painful, but not with my friends at US Med. Their motto is better service, better care. It's what they call white glove service. I was worn out by having to make multiple trips to my pharmacy only to discover the orders were not ready long lines, or, hey, we need to call your doc to confirm the refill. Don't worry, we'll take care of everything. Then only to find out about two weeks later, the pharmacy has not responded to the email or faxes. That's the thing I hated the most. Do what I did. Head over to usmed.com forward slash happy diabetic. Hey, are you ready for US Med to always provide you 90 days worth of supplies? and fast free shipping. They carry everything from insulin pumps and diabetes testing supplies to the latest CGMs, the Freestyle Libre 2 and 3, and the Dexcom G6 and G7. You know my love for the Libre 2 system, and if you're just starting out with Medicare like me, US Med should be your very next call. Broad private insurance coverage with over 800 private insurers, and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. If you're looking for supplies, everything from insulin pumps and diabetes testing supplies to the latest CGMs, well, and you're looking for better service, easier service, delivered right to your door with free shipping, that's right, I said it, free shipping, well, U.S. Med might be just what you're looking for. Simply call this number, 1-877-885-0012, or simply go to usmed.com forward slash happy diabetic. Don't wait any longer. Do what I did. Call now. Hey, I think that's my doorbell. I think that's my 90-day supply of my Libre 2 delivered right to my door with free shipping. What are you waiting for? Call now. So, Tiara, in your mind, what do you think is one of the biggest challenges diabetics face regarding eating today? A couple of things. One, knowing the combination of foods to eat. Um, I think there's still a lot of misinformation about the role of carb, carbohydrates. And then I will also say timing of foods, especially if you're pairing it with like physical activity. So I would just have to like the misinformation of carbs first. Like, you know, one thing I, I, I still hear a lot is, you know, I can't eat fruit, which is, you know, pretty, if if you really, really think about it, it's just like, really, you don't think that you don't think that you can eat like a, a natural whole food, but I, I understand why if like, if you're eating a banana and then you see a blood sugar spike up later on and you're like, okay, I can't have this. And it's just like, but bananas are really good for you. They're still really good in potassium and everything. Mm -hmm. It's more about like adjusting the the frequency and the the portion size of it as well. I think there's a lot of hesitation to eat things that people previously enjoyed. Um, So if you're someone that, you know, you, before your diagnosis, you're used to going out with your friends and, may, and, and maybe y'all would have a pizza night on a Friday night or a Saturday night, or you would go try out that new restaurant. And after your diagnosis, you're probably wondering like, is that something I can still do? How do I, how do I work around that? Do I tell my friends and fa- my family that I, that I probably can't do these things anymore? And, you know, and the answer to that usually is like, yes, you, you can do those things, but it is, but it is about thinking about it a little differently. So maybe, mm-hmm. 
you know, when you're going out to eat, um, you're, you know, you can ask for a box ahead of time. You can ask for a substitution. Maybe, maybe instead of having, um, let's say you're going out to a restaurant and there's like rice as one of the sides, you can ask for, can I split the rice and get rice and an extra vegetable? Right. Um, so there, there are little, there are different ways to, to work around those things. Um, and then the other part about like just timing of foods, like if you're someone and you notice that your blood sugar has been high all day, like one, and this is something I still struggle with sometimes is like, should I still eat? Even if my blood sugar is at like 200 or higher, like do I, but I'm hungry. Should I still eat? And it's just like, yeah, yeah I'm hungry. So I'm going to, I'm going to eat, but I'm probably also probably going to take a walk or maybe right. I'll, take some, uh, maybe I'll like take some medication uh, and I'm, I'm on insulin. So that's what I would usually take. But also if I am hungry, I would, it's going to change and my blood sugar is high, it's going to pop change what I would eat. So I wouldn't necessarily go for something that's higher in carbs. Uh, I would probably go for maybe like some almonds. I always keep almonds on hand um, or like um, rice cakes, which are lower in carbs. Like the rice cakes I have are about 11, 11 carbs, grams of carbs per cake. And I'll probably put in some peanut butter um, and then drink some water or have like a, a shake or something. So there are different ways to kind of work around that. And then if you're pairing it with physical activity as well, knowing should you should you eat like if your blood sugar is a little higher and, and you're about to exercise, what if you drop low? You know, what are some things that you should keep on hand? Should I keep a small snack on hand, like a candy bar or like a or like maybe some some Welch's fruit mm -hmm. um, snacks, things like that? Like those are questions that, that I think that people um, people with diabetes ask themselves. And, and again, but I think like the, the biggest thing that I still hear today are still just misconceptions around the role of carbs and carbs still play a very big, big, big role in just providing energy for our bodies. And if you're someone that's been used to eating certain types of carbs, there's no reason why you need to give them up. She says, think of them differently. And it may just be changing the portion sizes, how often you right. eat things and just track and just tracking how, how often you do that. Everything in moderation. Everything in moderation, which right. is, you know, and I think, I, but I also think what's really hard though is, and I, and I don't think this is necessarily limited to people with diabetes. I think it's just anyone who is on any kind of, has or anyone has to make any kind of like changes to, the, to their life. Like we really want someone to tell us like what to do and to, and tell us like, okay, how many carbs I need to be eating per day? What can I eat? What can't I eat? And it's, it's, it's difficult because at the end of the day, you're like, you, you're, Rick, you have to make the decision. You have to figure out what's really best for your life. And that takes time. That takes time. It takes trial and error. It takes, um, you know, seeing what, what will work with your blood sugar and oh, how things impact your blood sugar. And I think when you're, especially when you're newly diagnosed, you want to get it right. Like as soon Ooh, as possible, you just right. want get, to get going. Right. But that's, but I think for, for those of us who've had diabetes for a long time, we know that we're always learning about our diabetes. The, the learning never ends. And it's okay to, again, go back to that perfectionism. Like you don't need to be perfect. You're, you're, you're learning about your body, you're learning about your health. You're learning about how things affect your diabetes and food is a major part of that. Um, there are plenty of books that will give you information on, um, on, on, macros and, and, and nutrients and things like that. But at the end of the day, you kind of have to tailor it to, to where your life is at that moment. Right. And especially your ethnic style of eating, you know, exactly. it's like a newly diagnosed um, Hispanic person, for example, meets with a dietitian and they say, you really need four ounces of cottage cheese with peaches and a little bit of this yet that's not part of their ethnic style of eating. And so to say no more flour tortillas or whatever, it's not realistic. It's, right? it's, just, it's not going to work. Like, yeah, that's a great point. Like um, I, I remember when I went to go see uh, a nutritionist and I was already taking, I was in grad school for nutrition education. And I went to go see a nutritionist and they didn't ask me anything about what I like to eat. They didn't ask me about my cultural background or like 
the fact that I was never going to give up certain parts of what I've grown up eating. Like I mentioned that I grew up eating a lot of Jamaican food and a lot of Southern food. I'm not, not giving that stuff up. That's literally part of who I am. Right. And also it's going to cause a lot of issues when I'm around other family members who eat those same things. Like, so um, you have to, it's so, it's so important to be able to find, or at least for nutritionists to be able to be more culturally confident in that way. Because if someone told me I can't have plantains anymore, or someone told me I can't have um, beef patties anymore, I'd be like, well, then no, I like, look, you could tell me I can't have it. I'm going to have it. <laughs> that's the thing. I and am too. So, you know, um, and, and even then that's, that's still a learning process. And, but I think what's, what's great about just kind of like how the diabetes community and how um, social media works nowadays is that you can find people just like you who are eating the things that you've grown up eating, but in like, in healthier ways mm -hmm. and the healthier ways don't, doesn't necessarily mean, you know, bland or whatever. It, it can be just like switching out certain ingredients. So if you're, so even just using something like olive oil instead of vegetable oil is a change. Um, portion size is, is like probably like the mo most noticeable one. Right. It may, it may mean, um, instead of buying, you know, the, the, the canned beans, only if you do buy canned beans to make, making sure that you rinse them off to try to get as, as much of the salt off as possible. Maybe, maybe going for low, lower sodium versions or lower carb versions or lower mm -hmm. or fat versions. Those are little small, those are small changes that make a big difference over time. They do. And, and I really want people to focus on the overtime part because again, this is, it's a personal journey at the end of the day. And you can't be so hard on yourself. So if, you know, there are people listening who are like, well, you know, I grew up, you know, from a Hispanic background or Jamaican background or Asian background, and this is what I'm used to eating. A fine, fine little change that you can make within the ingredients. You may even have some of the ingredients at home right now and try and, and really pay attention to what, to what you're putting into your food. I think the great thing about home cooking in general, Robert, is that when you're, even if you're making your favorite fast food meal, it's going to be healthier because you're, you're, you're paying attention to what you're putting in it. You're not likely not putting as much salt in it right. or as much fat or anything like that. So you're, you're already making those healthy changes right then and there. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's a gold star moment, what you just said. I mean, again, we're back to this, the exercise portion. It's, it's an individual and the yep. eating, it's an individual. And again, one size doesn't fit all. But I think taking ordinary ingredients, turning them into something extraordinary yeah. in the style that you're used to eating is a way you can live happy and healthy with diabetes. Yeah. And for me, portion control made a big part of my, my change in my diet, you know, in my, in my lifestyle way of eating for sure. Yeah. Same here. Same here. Like I went from, um, and this is something I learned um, before I was diagnosed. Uh, I, I meant to add this earlier, but it's like, I've been to like, before my diagnosis, I've been um, blogging about living a healthy, sustainable lifestyle for years beforehand, before my diagnosis. So, um, but one of those things um, I learned early on was going from a, a larger size dinner plate. And I know people probably have heard this before, going from a large size dinner plate to like an, a smaller appetizer size plate as for my main entrees. Mm. Um, that was such a big thing because I'm already decreasing the, the amount of calories, fat, salt, carbs, whatever. And I, but I'm not cutting out the food that I love. I'm just eating less of it. And then I was filling in the gaps where I thought I was hungry, but I just, but I would drink like more water and then realize, okay, maybe I'm not as hungry as I thought. And I went into really just being more mindful about what I was putting in into my body and that, and I also track and I track my food now sometimes I also track my food for a little bit, just so I can get an understanding mm -hmm. of, you know, what am I eating on a, on a regular basis? You know, for people who are kind of starting out, especially if you're someone that's newly diagnosed, or maybe you're restarting your diabetes journey is to like not change anything for like a week or so. Like I would say like, like just track just to see where you're eating and then figure out what the what changes are, are easy for you to make. Mm -hmm. Um, because I feel like when you do that, you feel more empowered to, to make those changes and, and it's easier to kind of, to stick with them rather than someone just saying like, cut all this out. It's like, no, like you, you, you are someone who is capable of changing your life 
you have you have the tools and also there's something else I want to add is that you're enough the way that you are right now you can you you got this that's and but you really just have to kind of like um really really believe in that and surround yourself with with people who um who also believe in you that that you can make those changes as well yeah I think that's powerful I think surrounding yourself with a a community of of like-minded folk um is super important I know for me it was life-changing for me to sit in a room with other diabetics for the very first time realizing, oh, there's other people here that have the same challenges as I do, right? Not, I'm not as unique as I thought I was, right? Okay. Uh, and that really was kind of my diabetic spiritual awakening for me, knowing that, that I'm not alone in this journey. And there's so many amazing places to, to get community. I know Beyond Type 2 has great community. There's monthly get-togethers and all kinds of stuff going on. So you're not alone out there. Hanging out with like-minded people, if you can, is important. Yes, yes, absolutely. And 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 as, you know, I always love the thing that this is like a pay it forward moment too. Like when you've been on your, your journey, your personal health journey, diabetes journey for a while, and you've picked up certain things and you know that there are certain things that have helped you and help you remain sustainable and in a healthy way, like to, to help help someone else because you know what it's like to not have any kind of guidance or or, or to be in a place where where things were meant, might have felt overwhelming. You know, help help the next person too, and that's mm-hmm. where I think a lot of, where a lot of those groups come come into play. Like you know, you mentioned Beyonce too, and our and our meetups, like those meetups that we have. Um, you know, those are a great place where people will just share information mm-hmm. and that's, i think one of the most powerful things that you can do as a community member um of the diabetes community which is to share the information that you know that has helped you mm-hmm. um because you 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 want to make sure that um the next person has it easier than, than you had it right but I, but I, that's my like philosophy towards for anything not not even just you know health and wellness and diabetes but like just just helping the next person up yeah um tiara do you have or can you recall in your mind your diabetic aha moment? When you say aha moment, like as in like the well, moment I realized that I had, like I had it down or? Yeah, like the light bulb came on and oh my gosh, you know, something clicked for you. Yes. Um, it, it was my misdiagnosis um when so when I found out I was misdiagnosed it made sense like it like I was okay this does make sense because I mean my my medication had gone up but it would my a1c still wasn't going down my blood sugar still weren't going down I was still having crazy highs like three three hundreds four hundreds um and so when I got the when I got the diagnosis, the, the misdiagnosed, or when I found out I was misdiagnosed, um, I was like, okay, that makes sense as to why as to why nothing was working. Not as well as a habit, not as well as a habit when I when I'd been diagnosed. So I think that was my aha moment because at that point I was able to kind of get the care that I needed. Um and it helped. It just it, it made it made life so much easier. I mean, there are other things with diabetes that was still really really hard, but just like knowing that I was going to get the kind of care that I, I'd been seeking was really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have another aha moment um, recently, and I don't, um, I don't, I don't know if it was because maybe, maybe it's because of the technology that, I, that I'm using. So I started using Control IQ um, through Tandem. Um, and uh, Dexcom, and my aha moment was that um, I love to be as hands off my diabetes as possible. Like I am not an injection type of person. I know people who don't like using insulin pumps. I think that's great for them. Um, I am not that person. Like if I do not have tech with me, I am not the best at managing my diabetes. I am straight up with that. Like if I don't have a CGM one, Blood sugar is not getting tested as often as, as it probably needs to be. If I'm not having my insulin pump on, I'm probably not inject, injecting or taking the right amount of injections as, as I need to be. So that was definitely my aha mm-hmm. moment. 
knowing like just like being real with myself like are you really going to really do this like if you had to be back on MDI what would it, what would it be like for you and honestly it would be really it would be really hard not impossible just really really difficult so um yeah that's that's where I'm at now I I like the the thought about technology helping you to be a better diabetic. I know it has for me. I, yeah. I wear a Libre 2 CGM. Um, and if you're out there listening and are wondering about what is a continuous glucose monitor, uh, what they call a CGM, you know, meet up with your doctor, you know, ask the questions, be proactive, see if that device is right for you, because I haven't really poked my finger for five years. I mean, as on a regular basis, um, and it's been very freeing to me. Yes. Yes. And also and, getting that information like that you wouldn't get otherwise from freaking your fingers. So just right. like what your blood sugar is like when you sleep, um, kind of knowing like how your blood sugar changes in between meals is really, is really nice to know. Um, it's nice not having like callous fingers as much. Um, so that's, that's a really big, you know, benefit of benefits of wearing a CGM and like other things that a doctor could help you with is right. walking, walking through insurance options with you. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if you're someone with type two diabetes, like, um, making sure that insurance does, does cover it and getting your right. doctor to write a prior auth note for you. Um, and then, and then knowing that there are other options out there for you as well. So like, if you're someone that's on multiple um, daily insulin injections, you might want to explore and pump too. So it's definitely something to talk to your doctor about. Um, so, and then of course, like, you know, mentioned insurance before, but just like the, the financial options are mm -hmm. something that that doctor or um, diabetes care and education specialist can help you with. Right. Um, I mean, I'm on Medicare uh, and they cover my CGMs. Um, if you, when you're in, in all, and you know, in all clarity and all, you know, clearness, this podcast today is brought to us by U.S. Med Supply. So they're one of the largest suppliers of the Libre2 system. And, and that's where I get my stuff from. Uh, and they're all Medicare compliant. So if you're interested, listen to the rest of the podcast and I'll give you some information on how to get a hold of that. But um, I'm not here to make you go, uh, you know, use U.S. Med Supply as a supplier. But if, if you think getting a CGM is a hassle, you're sadly mistaken. It's super easy today. And I would recommend doing that. Yeah. Access has like definitely gotten, um, you know, improved over the years. Um, what I've seen, um, and like with the, you know, you mentioned that you wear the freestyle Libre, there's like the, my freestyle, um, uh, program, I think so at active, um, where you can try it out for like two weeks. Um, I would say, yeah, just talk to your doctor, like in most, it's, if you have a primary care physician, um, your primary care, primary care physician probably knows about the free salary, right? Um, especially since more people with type two are, mm -hmm. are getting access to that. Right. Um, so just talk to your doctor about like, if, even if they have like a spare one available, then maybe you could just try it out. Right. Um, that's helpful as well. Yeah. Um, resources out there to help you talk to your doctor about how to get a CGM and how mm -hmm. to advocate yourself if, if you run into issues with insurance yeah you are your you are your best advocate absolutely so when you show up at the doctor's office say hey i want i think i want a cgm why, why wouldn't i want one and and really get into the conversation so um because i know that it's changed my life yep. I, and those devices uh can make a big difference absolutely and yeah. you can share it with your friends and your family and or anyone else who will support your diabetes management like I share my CGM data with my, with my friends and my fam. And, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they know my blood sugar is low and they know if I'm a little too high, I tell them to really ignore the highs, but I really tell them to what, what to pay attention to, which is, which are the lows. And I really think if you're someone who experiences hypoglycemia, especially and you, it, or if you have hype, if you're hypoglycemia unaware most of the time, like a CGM is such a big help with that. Like, mm -hmm. Those alarms um, are truly life saving. So, um, and I think they are. Honestly, I think all people with diabetes should um, be able to try a CGM and have access to it. So, whether if you're on insulin or not, like you should, you should just try it out just so you know, like the patterns of your blood sugar. Right. Like, there's no harm in getting that kind of information. Right. Right. 
Tiara, it's been amazing having you here. What else should we talk about? What else is on your mind today? Um, so I would love to get into just some um easy ways just to start cooking. And Rob, you probably talk about this on all, all, all the other shows. Uh, so I don't think I've recreated the wheel here, but just like some easy ways just to, to start cooking and really keeping it fun in the kitchen. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um so, you know, I, I watch a lot of cooking channel and food network and, um, I love, you know, I love having my iron chef moments. Um, my favorite show was the kitchen on food network with Sonny Anderson, Jeff's Carrion, and all of them. Um, and then I love Gaffietti show, it's his new show, God's Ranch Kitchen, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I use those shows as inspiration to try to see which recipes are easy for me to try. And I also like love to see what ingredients they're using because I probably already have them. And and like they use some really common ingredients like, like cream cheese or sour cream or regular cream or garlic or paprika like or vinegar, stuff like that that you likely already have. And it's so cool because um, I'm like, okay, I can make that. Like I have the tools, I have a skillet, I have a spatula, I have all this other stuff. I have an air fryer, I can make it. Um, but I re- but I recognize for a lot of folks who are just starting to cook, you know, it can be, you know, that stuff can be a little intimidating. Um, so I love to also look up websites like things like all recipes, where mm-hmm. I can like, find recipes that are like five steps or less, or maybe 10 steps or less, and probably take maybe like 30 minutes or less. And some of the things or like cheap hacks that I love to mm-hmm. use are um, using frozen vegetables. So I mentioned this earlier about how I like to take some frozen vegetables, like pop it in the microwave. That's because I don't like using up a lot of dishes. I live alone and I'm the person who has to clean up everything. So I'm going to make sure it's minimal as possible. So I like to take a microwave safe container, throw my favorite ve- vegetables, my favorite seasonings, steam it for about um, you know three to five minutes. And a lot of vegetables come in, in microwavable bags nowadays anyway. Right. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, I sometimes put on a skillet to saute it with like a little bit of oil or now I'll pop an air fryer so I can get the nice char that I like. And those are good ways to kind of liven up the flavor of frozen vegetables, which are just as good as, or if not sometimes better than fresh, depending mm-hmm. on the season. Um, and it's a really good way for me to like keep it, really keep it creative. Um, and then another thing that I love to do, and I think this is something that's super easy, especially now with summer coming up, is to explore with different herbs, especially fresh herbs. If you're someone that loves chicken, especially chicken breast, one thing that you can do is to take, again, I mentioned, I feel like I mentioned garlic a million times, but take some garlic, some olive oil, maybe a little bit of butter, and like kind of put in like a fresh sprig of rosemary. And you kind of let the rosemary and the garlic and the oil come together and it smells really great. And the, you like you cook the chicken in that and the chicken absorbs all that flavor from the garlic and the rosemary mm-hmm. and the oil and you have a perfect meal. Or you may want to add some lemons to it or you may want to add some tarragon or some sage. Some really great ways to just add fresh flavor without adding too many calories. Mm. I love it. I love it. And listen, you got to have garlic, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, keep, like, just keep some cloves. Um, you can also buy like the little jarred ones. Robert, I don't know about your thoughts on like the little jarred pre minced garlic. I have, I, them. I have it in my refrigerator right now. That's usually what I buy. You yeah. can open it up. It's easy. It works really great. Yeah. I use that often. Um, I also love um, taking some French bread. So I, I love making, I love cheesy bread. And mm. mm-hmm. you know, I, I won't order them from a pizza place. I'll just make them myself. I'll just go to the store, buy like the big loaf of French bread, which is usually like a dollar or so. And yeah. then I'll put some, um, some mozzarella cheese and I'll mix in some like garlic powder, some, um, use some dried basil or fresh basil if I have it. And I'll also mix some, to can of, I'll take a can of, can of tomato sauce, put that in a, in a uh, microwavable safe container, heat that up. Um, add some Italian spices to that. And then I'll take like the bread, slice it up, um, spread it on top of the bread, put on some cheese, put it in the mm. broil, And that's like a quick like snack right there. Or if you don't want Love the tomatoes, 
you can just you can just have like the oil and garlic and herbs and a little bit of um pepperoncini or red pepper flakes to add in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's a, like a quick way to eat like some things that you would probably order out at a pizza restaurant or at your favorite restaurant as an appetizer you can make all of that at home right so those are just and it's simple easy ingredients yeah really good ways to, to really keep it creative well tiara you know that garlic is really good for you right it's super healthy a lot of minerals a lot of vitamins uh, but did you know that garlic will make you sleep good you know, it's not a surprise because I feel like I've been sleeping a lot better lately. I don't know if yeah. it was exercise or, or, or the amount of garlic in my recipes. It does make you sleep good, but it does make you sleep alone. <laughs> also makes sense too, since I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, hey, what else What else should we chat about? Um, you know, I, I think another thing... Um, and I think this is something we talked we talked about earlier. It's just like the role of just community and why I think it's just so integral into reaching any health goal that you have. Mm-hmm. It's important to surround yourself with like-minded people. When you surround yourself with people who are on a similar journey as you, there, I feel like you, you, you learn to kind of push yourself a, a little a little bit more. You challenge yourself a little bit more. But the challenge is not coming from, I need to beat this person. That's not where it's coming from. It's coming from, I want to better myself, whatever that means. I want to get stronger in this area. So I, and I'll use like um, my gym community as an example. Um, and most of my gym, gym folks know that I think I'm... I, I feel like I'm really open about my diabetes. Like I, I'll have my pump out and in, in Dexcom and stuff out. Um, and sometimes ask questions about that. But being part of that community, Robert, has changed my life in a way that I have that I hadn't expected, especially mm. in the last year. I show up every single day to, to seeing friends who work their behinds off to beat whatever goal is in their mind. I don't know what goal that they have, but I can see it on their faces. I see the determination on their faces that they're going to be 1% better today. Or may or maybe or maybe them being 1% better, it was just, just showing up. And there's no sense of of competition between us. If anything, it's a sense of, hey, you got this. You got this last rep. You got the last set. You have this. You you've done three other sets. You have one more in you, and I and the reason why why I, I love being in the community like that because you realize how it radiates in other parts of your life, where you have that I have one more in me type of mindset, and that's that's something that helps you push to whatever that next level is for in in your life. I I realize I realize I just <laughs> I feel so um it's funny Robert I feel like. Uh, one of those like fitness gurus that like talks mm. about the benefits of fitness. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's not, it's not necessarily about fitness. It's the community because I've been to a lot of gyms. I've been around a lot of food, food groups, especially a lot of folks who diff- who've done different diets and they have extreme views on that. But when you're in an environment where everyone is just, where the goal is just to be healthy, no matter your body size and I'm a heavier person. So I don't, I never feel ashamed about how I look. I'm this. I'm one of the slowest people. So there are times where I cannot finish everything. And I don't feel ashamed about that because I'm in a community of people who, who are just, who want to cheer you on instead of trying to hold you back. And I feel like having people who would want to cheer you on every single time, even if you're having the toughest day, or even if you showed it, or even if you had like a tough day that they don't even know about, hmm. those people just want to see you thrive and be successful that's right. who you surround yourself with and, and I really feel like that's also important in any part of your life but especially when it comes to your health and especially when it comes to, to your diabetes you, you want to be around people who are all about seeing you being the healthiest version of yourself mm. and it's gotten to the point now Robert where I have uh one of my friends I don't know if he'll I don't know if he'll listen but I'm going to put them out here anyway and I've told other folks this but it's got to the point because they know that I have diabetes they look out for me now 
Like they like they know, they even know apparently now when I my blood sugar is low and they know how I get. So now one of them will say, I need you to go get a shake or or eat something before you come to class because I know how you get after class. Mm-hmm. And that's that kind of community that helps you be like, oh yeah, I know that my blood sugar is gonna drop low, but but they know as well. Those are people who look out for you. And those yeah. are the people I think everyone with diabetes deserves to be around. People who want to see you healthy. People who want to see you smile. People, people who want to see you happy. Those people need to be around. Wow. That's powerful. And there is so much great community. Um, and in the show notes of this podcast, we'll list some contact information where you'll find community that you could trust, that's safe, that's encouraging. Um, right. And I would just encourage anybody out there to to know that you are not alone no you're not alone there's no. there's someone else who's been right where you are and they found a solution to to move them past it and lean on those people and then when the next person behind you is coming up you, you and you hear the same issues or similar issues you help them up as well because yeah. we're, we're we all need to support each other right um, and if, you know, same thing with diabetes, if you hear someone that's like, I am so burnt out by diabetes and we all have burnout from diabetes. Um, and I can't, I don't feel like touching my blood sugar. I don't feel like e- eating all the things that, that I'm usually eating. I'm tired of tracking my food, all the other stuff. I'm just tired of diabetes. I don't want it anymore. Well, we know that we can't get rid of it, but we do know that we need to, that we need to be leading on people who can help us through those tough times and helping us through those tough times, mm-hmm. maybe um, having someone take a walk with us. It, it may even just be having someone just listen to us and listen, listen to, to the things that are going on in our lives that are making, that's making diabetes just harder than usual. Um, but the point is, is that we just always need to continue to support um, one another and know that we're not alone and that it's okay to, to ask for help. Wow. Tara, this has been amazing. Thank Super you. inspirational. Oh my gosh. Thanks for being on the podcast. Will you come oh, back? I would love to come back. I would love to come back. And you know, I, I have to say this, Robert, because um, I am still thinking about it years later, which is your sugar-free lemon um, lemon tart that you made at a conference for TCYD years ago. <laughs> and it was still like one of the most delicious things I've ever had. And wow. it was sugar- it was so good. You were um, so kind. And, you know, again, Robert, like you've always just been such, you know, an amazing person, an inspiring person. So I just say thank you for everything that you do for, just, you know, people with diabetes, especially people with type 2 diabetes. It's, yeah. you know, we we need more people like you in our community. We need more people like you in the community. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Tara, thanks so much. Again, so happy that you could hang out with us. Um, and I'll put all kinds of information in the show notes where to find you, where to find community and love to have you come back. Maybe you'll even come back with your mom on the line. Yeah, she will. Uh, she's, you know, I would love to talk, talk with her about food because she's actually been, she's been the person that's, that really um, helped me nurture my love yeah. for food for the years. Yeah. As adults. Yeah. So she was my guinea pig and she gave me honest feedback for better or for worse. Um, yeah. And I think that's what mothers, that's what, that's what mothers do. Right. Well, well, Tara, thanks again for being on the show. How do you feel when we come back to play our rapid fire four one one round? I am excited. I can't wait. Big prizes. Okay. (laughs) Okay, everybody. Welcome back. It's time now. For the rapid fire four one one round, Tiara, are you ready to play? Yes. <laughs> Here's how the game is going to work. I'm going to ask you some simple questions, like, and and let us know what your preference is: butter or olive oil, riding a bike or hiking, that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. First thing that comes to your mind. Here we go: olive oil or coconut oil? Olive oil. Pineapple or papaya? Pineapple. Waffles or pancakes? Pancakes. Grilled steak or grilled fish? Grilled fish. Chunky or smooth peanut butter? Smooth. Oh, chunky for me. (laughs) 
Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day? Valentine's Day. Uh, what's your favorite vegetable? Broccoli. Mine too. Bacon <laughs> or ice cream? You said bacon or ice cream? Yes. It can't be. Oh, man. It can be both. Bacon. <laughs> bacon. Okay. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Coffee. <laughs> Me too. Roller coasters or merry-go-rounds? Roller coaster. And then finally, Tiara, if you could break bread with anyone, past or present, who would that be? Viola Davis. Oh, Viola. Why Viola? Because I think she is the I think she's the best actress um, I've ever seen. Um, and I'm so inspired by her story. I mean, I could have said her or Oprah or Serena Williams, I, any of those three. But Viola, she's so powerful. Mm. Um, whether she's dominated um, both the TV screen and the big screen. And um, yeah, she's just, every time I watch one of her performances, I just, I'm so engrossed in every character. Mm. I would love to meet her one day. And also, she's had, she's had pre-diabetes, so she's been, um, done some diabetes work. Oh, nice. Mm. I would even cook dinner for both of you guys. Oh, <laughs> I know she would love your food. That'd be I'm, fun. Yeah, that'd be let's, a lot of fun. Let's let's try to make that happen. Yes. Someone <laughs> call. So if you have the hookup to Viola, let us know. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Tiara, it's great having you on the Happy Day Better Kitchen podcast. Thanks think, for being Barbara. in the kitchen with all of us. And um, again, would you, would you consider coming back again? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Robert. This was a great, a great, great experience. Um, you know, I love you. And this has been just a, such a fun interview. So yeah, I would love to come back. That'd be awesome. Okay, everybody, we will be right back. The Happy Diabetic does not provide medical advice. This podcast is offered only to provide general information regarding health. Information in this podcast is really not intended to be a substitute for medical treatment performed by a health care professional. So if you have questions, consult them before making any major changes to your diet or your eating or exercise lifestyle. I'm not a doctor or a certified educator. I'm a chef living with type 2 diabetes just like you. Although I have three children, Attila, Dracula, and Frankenstein, that makes me a psychiatrist of sorts. If you're loving what you hear in the kitchen, be sure to share this podcast. A happy Diabetic Kitchen with all your friends and family. And if you want to hear the latest episodes, just head over to my website, happydiabetic.com. We'll always have them there or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. Of course, hoping this is your favorite podcast. And don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss a single recipe or podcast episode. Our podcast is sponsored by my friends at U.S. Med Supply. Our theme music by the Happy Diabetic Kitchen Band. And of course, our kitchen mascots, Scout and Tucker. This year, better than last year. This month, better than last month. This week, better than last week. And this day, better than yesterday. Thanks everyone for tuning in. And let me leave you with this thought. Alan Woodfelt once said, food is symbolic of love when words are inadequate. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And remember this, no one loves you more than me. See you next time.